Welcome to this week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast, where experienced professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders based in Kingston-upon-Thames are invited on to share their story with us. I'm your host, Amir Rochalima. This week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast is brought to you by Holland Hahn & Wills, a financial planning and wealth management firm based in Kingston-upon-Thames. Holland Hahn & Wills specialises in retirement planning for senior professionals and successful business owners. Visit hhw-uk.com to start feeling more relaxed and confident about your financial future. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. I'm joined today by Amanda Cullen. Amanda is the founder of Business Made Simpler, a coaching firm that helps people grow their business by resolving any issues which are holding them back. What's unique about Amanda is how she draws from her experience, from her previous career in corporate pensions, where she had to navigate through a very male-dominated industry to achieve the success she deserved, to champion and encourage business owners to achieve their full potential today. And be sure to listen to the end, where Amanda explains why accountability is one of the biggest strengths a coach can bring to a client-coach relationship. So whether you're interested in knowing more about what it takes to become a successful business coach, or would like to know more about running your own successful independent business, then I hope you enjoy this episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Welcome, Amanda Cullen, to the Inside Kingston podcast. Amanda, I'm really excited about this conversation because not only is your corporate background in pensions a topic that's really close to my heart for obvious reasons, but I'm also curious as to how you apply the lessons you learned from your corporate days into helping small business owners today. But to kick off this conversation, I'd like to go back in time, if that's okay. So where did you grow up? I was born in Wimbledon. So not very far away, but we moved down to the south coast when I was about five. So in practice, I grew up in West Sussex, um, initially in Littlehampton and then school in Brighton um, before I went off to university in Southampton and then moved to London when I started my career. Oh, fantastic. And what did you study at university? I studied French and Spanish. Um, at the time, I thought I wanted to be an actuary. So I already knew all about the pensions profession. I thought I wanted to be an actuary. Um, but I was being awkward because most actuaries read maths and having checked the requirements of the Institute of Actuaries, I could see that you didn't need a maths degree, you needed a decent A-level, which I was on track to get. And I thought, if I'm going to spend the rest of my life with numbers, I don't want to spend the next three years with them at university as well. So I did languages. That's fascinating. So from modern languages mm -hmm. to the world of pensions, yep. tell me a little, about, a little bit about your career journey in that field. Mm. Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because having just said that I already knew about pensions and thought that's what I wanted to do. Actually, when I started my career, I had two possible directions to go in. And one was pensions and the other was to go and work for a charity. And I had okay. two job offers on the table. One was as a trainee pension consultant and the other was as a, a trainee, if you like, with uh, a, a charity called Council and Care for the Elderly. And at first sight, they seem completely different. But actually, the common thread is that they both help people in retirement when they're getting on in life and they can no longer necessarily do everything for themselves. And that really was, was my kind of core purpose at the time, which was always about helping people and being particularly interested in helping older people. And how did you feel you achieved that in, your, in the pensions world? Did you feel like you could add value on that front? In the early days, definitely. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate, I think, to have a boss whose, whose values, if you like, were similar to mine. And he was very much uh, of that mind that pen, this, this industry is all about making sure people have enough to live on in retirement. And that worked fine for about the first 10 to 20 years of my life in the, in the pensions industry. But as uh, pension funds became more and more underfunded and co companies had to chip in more and more money, it became all about the finances. So it went from how can we protect our members, uh, i.e. the end users, the pensioners, to how can we minimise cost for the sponsoring employer? Mm. And it was that transition, really, that led me to gradually fall out of love with the industry. Uh, that's a shame. 
Now, mm. the the pensions industry, it's traditionally been very male dominated. And mm-hmm. uh, I've seen you write before about a particular incident in your career where you noticed you were being paid less than some of your male equivalent colleagues. Could you tell us a little bit about that, given that today there's a lot more focus on uh, equality in the workplace, but also what the outcome was that from where you took your career from that point on? Mm, that's interesting. I think that happened twice, actually. Wow. The first time it happened was quite early on, and I became very aware that I was earning a lot less than my colleagues, and I went in to talk to my boss, said, I think I'm, I'm underpaid, and he said, I agree with you, but we're not going to pay you anymore. Because... Um, because your colleagues manage our pension scheme and if we put your salary up, they will know. And we can't do that mid-year, so we won't do it. And eventually, when I went to hand in my notice, he said, oh, that's a real shame. We were just about to call you in and offer you this massive training programme, instant salary rise, blah, blah, blah. I said, it's too late. Absolutely. That was the first time. I think the second time was was a lot later on. Um, And... I don't think I went in nearly as hard-headed the second time. And over time, I negotiated up to um, an, an, a level that I felt was equivalent to my yeah. peers. So I find that fascinating, Amanda, because throughout this conversation, we're going to get to unpick a little bit about how you help small business owners mm-hmm. and um, even people within your coaching practice to go in and negotiate what they're actually worth. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll pause that for now, okay. but we will definitely be coming back to that. Sure. Um, but interestingly, that sort of naturally brings us into the present. And could you tell us a little bit about what prompted you to set up your business and then what your business looks like today? Yes. So initially it was a move away from my, my pensions career rather than the move to coaching. So it was, I need to get out of this my values have diverted from the industry. Uh, my skills are actually becoming obsolete because I was an expert in final salary pension schemes and there are fewer and fewer of those around. I had moved into business management and business leadership at the time when many of my colleagues had, had naturally retrained into the um, more modern final salary uh, uh, money purchase defined contribution pension scheme. So I kind of missed the boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I had specialised in was governance. And I spent far too long thinking, what am I going to do instead of pensions? And then had a light bulb moment. And the light bulb moment was actually when I was volunteering on a women's leadership training programme. And the woman at the front of the room who was a coach got us to visualise where we wanted to be in three years' time. And I thought, I want to be doing what you're doing. I want to be a coach. And that's where it started. And I knew immediately that I wasn't the sort of person who was going to get out of bed the next morning and go, I'm a coach now. I... I guess I'd been in a regulated industry, which you'll understand, all my life. And the whole concept of not being qualified and not having a credential in coaching was just completely alien to me. So I did some research, explored a number of different coaching training organisations and finally picked the one I ended up training with, which at the time was called the Coaches Training Institute, is now called the Coactive Training Institute, both known as CTI, which I think is one of the best, if not the best, coach training organisations, but maybe I would say that, and went through their foundation programme, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I really don't like this. But I was already committed to the intermediate programme, I thought I'll see it through. Some point during the intermediate programme, I fell in love with it and decided that actually I kind of got this and I did enjoy it, and then decided to go on and do the advanced training because that's what gave, gave me the formal qualification with the letters after my name. And at the time, all the way through that, it was in my mind that I would gradually build up a coaching portfolio alongside the the pensions career. And at some point in the nebulous future, would scale back the pensions, would scale up the coaching. And and at some point, one would take over from the other. But as with all things in life, (laughs) things didn't quite work out like that. And literally a few months later, things came to a head at work and I couldn't stand it a minute longer. Resigned, left day one of, oh my goodness, now I've got to get this coaching business off the ground and get going. And I didn't immediately move into business coaching, actually. I started off doing midlife career coaching, didn't really work, benefit of hindsight, my heart wasn't in it. Then started doing executive coaching, which was back in the world I knew, which did work, but didn't fire me up. Okay. And about three years ago, just over three years ago now, I helped a friend out who ran a small business, so I did my first piece of proper business coaching and instantly fell in love with it. I could see the light bulbs going on in front of me. I could see what what an impact I could have on the business owner. And I love the fact that you're with the decision maker and they can 
turn their ship around really, really quickly. Yeah. Uh, and ever since then, I have pref- prefer ever, ever since then I've focused on primarily on business owners, and now that's all I do. So, Amanda, for the benefit of our listeners, could you describe a little bit about what coaching is, in your view, mm. and what are some of the benefits that somebody can get out of coaching? Yes. So, at its purest, coaching is asking the right questions to enable the person that you are coaching to work out the answers for themselves. Mm-hmm. And that applies to any kind of coaching, whether it's life coaching, business coaching, executive coaching, sports coaching, health coaching, relationship coaching, any kind of coaching. The real skill is in listening to what the client says and asking the questions that open their minds or open up ideas and, and, and awareness to how they need to move forward. I think a good business coach combines that with business expertise and business experience. So there are some business coaches that will do pure coaching, but I think probably not very many. There are some business coaches who, in my view, are more like business consultants or business advisors Mm. who are inclined to tell tell their clients what they should do. Business coach, my kind of business coaching is a blend of the two. So I do a lot of questioning, a lot of listening. I think my real skill is clarifying. So often I will hear a client download everything that's going on in their business and all their worries and concerns and confusions and and then I'll go okay so what I heard you say was one two three which of those do we need to work on and then I can quite often hear them go oh yes that's right so it's that clarifying, that clarity that I bring that is, that is, if you like, my particular expertise in coaching. But my business background and the fact that I was in business leadership in the pensions industry for a number of years means that I can also offer business strategies and business tools. But I try and do it without any jargon. See, and that's what I was thinking as you were describing the way you approach coaching, because your, your background in corporate pensions, mm. especially in the governance side of it, would have meant a lot of problem prob- oh, sorry, problem solving but also risk management mm-hmm. which is which is sort of avoiding problem solving almost um, and can you see yourself using some of those skills and the training you had in your corporate days in into helping small business owners today yeah definitely definitely so a lot of what I do is I often talk about a four-step process so I, I ask clients why they do what they do I ask them what they want to achieve with it which is vision or goal setting or any of those names that you might like to call it, which all come from the corporate world as well. Then we talk about strategy, how they're going to achieve whatever their goal is. And business strategy is all from the corporate world. And then we talk about planning, business planning. And when I talk about business planning with my small business clients, I'm not talking about that long, complicated, long-winded document that one might have to produce to satisfy a bank manager or an investor, but more a simple document that enables them to consolidate and clarify what it is they're trying to do with the business. That's phenomenal. Could you describe your typical customer? That's quite a challenge. Most of my clients are service-based businesses rather than product-based businesses. But having said that, I have a product-based business client at the moment. They come from a whole range of industries, everything from health to law to design to consulting, you name it. Um, The majority of them have been going for a while. I do do some startup work, but intriguingly, I find that most people have been going at least a good few months and sometimes many years at the point when they come for coaching. So whilst whilst startups often need a helping hand, it's much more practical. It's not really coaching so much as business knowledge. The the ones that I think get the best out of my coaching, which is maybe not quite the question you asked, are the ones who've been running for quite a while. They know how to run a business. They know what they're good at but they've lost their way in some way, usually. Either they've got so bogged down that they can't see the wood for the trees, or they've got stuck, so they can't move. They're, They're doing okay, but they can't seem to take it to the next level. Or quite often what's happened is some sort of life event has got in the way, 
and has paused, well, not paused, but stalled their business. Mm. And now, for some reason, they, they are ready to move forward. So I've had clients who've had family illness, where they've had to take a back seat while they care for somebody. I've had clients who've had personal illness, who've had to scale their business back, and now they're getting better and they can scale it back up again. I've had clients who perhaps have had uh, a business partner of some sort, and that business relationship is changed, mm. usually stopped, and so, again, they're ready to do something different. So that, that the, the thing I think that is kind of perhaps the common denominator is that they're all ready for some sort of change. So if they're brand new businesses, they've got the basics in place and now they're ready to change in, in terms of stepping up a gear. If they've been going for a while, something has triggered the need to change. It's interesting because, um, and I, I believe I had this conversation with a previous guest who was in a completely different field to yours, the commonality there between the two conversations is it seems to me your biggest skill is in listening. And sometimes these business owners, they've just hadn't had a chance to speak with someone who's actually listening to what they want to say, as in your words, to download on you. And then over and above that, to translate that listening into some actionable steps that the business owner will actually see them take them to the next level. Was that, would that be a fair summary? That is a fair summary. <clears throat> I think there are two things they get. One is a shoulder to cry on <laughs> or a sounding board might be a less emotive way of putting it mm -hmm. uh, and the other is is, is clarity and, and listening uh, oh sorry no the other is actually accountability which is massive right which is because massive without accountability it's easy to just leave things on a table it really is but the the sounding board shoulder to cry on side is is important too mm. because a lot of business owners have been employees in the past so they've been a cog in a relatively big wheel They've had peers, they've had bosses. And then when they run their own business, they suddenly realise that the buck stops with them. And there isn't really anybody that they can ask. Um, and if they do have employees, which most of my clients don't initially, but some of them have one or two, then they're expected to have the answers. So it's quite difficult to show weakness with somebody who is accountable to you. I, I, I experienced that in corporate life, actually, when I first went into leadership. But it's very true for small business owners. The accountability piece is massive, though, as you rightly say, because, you you know, when you have a job, you've got um, somewhere you have to turn up, you've got expectations you've got goals probably to meet targets to meet um, and if you don't do any of that then sooner or later somebody's going to haul you over the coals and you're not going to get that paycheck at the end of the month but when it's your own business you know you it doesn't really matter I mean it matters if you don't turn up when you're supposed to be meeting a client but whether you get out of bed in the morning and think oh, I can't be bothered today you know do something else instead you can probably get away with that once in a blue moon Absolutely. if you do it day after day after day the business ain't going to last very long no not at all that's really fascinating stuff Amanda, I wonder if I can switch gears with you slightly because I want to actually uh, ask you a question that reflects on your own business practices. So mm -hmm. um, you're an active member of the Kingston Chamber of Commerce and I'm just wondering um, with your activities within the chambers and other activities that you do, what have you found to be successful to attract new clients to you? I would say that the vast majority of my clients come by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true for all kinds of business, but I think it's true for a lot of service-based businesses where you have to build a relationship, or at least your most successful clients are often ones you've built a relationship with, to a greater or lesser extent, or who are recommended to you by somebody who you have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, networking is absolutely crucial to me. Um, the Chamber of Commerce is, is one of a number of networks that I'm involved with locally, and I make a conscious a strategy, if you like, to go to at least one networking event with each of the groups that I belong to once a month. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a basic basic minimum in a sense. And then there are ad hoc networking opportunities in the area that I would also tap into from time to time. So, given your your background in in the corporate world, where perhaps you didn't have to do so much networking in the past, could I just ask you to elaborate, perhaps, on how you felt about networking when you set up your business and some of the things that you've maybe implemented into your own networking routine that could help other small business owners that are looking to start network networking themselves? Yes, I think I was relatively lucky that I've always enjoyed meeting people and I did a lot of client relationship management in my previous career mm. as time went on. So I, I definitely didn't have that barrier of I'm not confident walking into a room of people I don't know and talking to them because I've been doing that for a lot for a lot of my career. So I did have a head start from that perspective. 
but I definitely didn't have any experience of talking about what I did in my business. Well, I, I suppose I had experience talking about what I did in the old career, but not not about my business and, and or, or selling myself in that sense. Um, and I, and I, I think the thing about networking is to play to what suits your personality. So if you are an extrovert and you're happy to walk into a big room full of strangers, then you, go, you can go to pretty much any networking thing. True. If you are less outgoing or less confident, then I would say to people, pick something that's more structured. Mm. You'll probably feel more comfortable in the kind of setup where... It's a sit-down meal, so you've got people either side of you to talk to. You maybe know what the pro- program of events, the 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 agenda for the meeting is. You probably know whether you have. Well, you need to find out whether you're going to have to stand up and talk for thirty seconds or sixty seconds about your business. And preparation, preparation, preparation. The more prepared you are, the more confident you'll feel. So yes, you can wing it if you've been doing it for years and you're really confident. But if you're not confident or you're new to it, you have to prepare. You have to make sure you know in advance what you're going to say. And nobody will mind if you read it as long as you've read it several times beforehand and you're not going, and the dumb said (laughs) to the cat, but you are relatively fluent. Those are great tips. Those are great tips. Amanda, what are some of the key business lessons that you've learned throughout your life? Hmm. I think one of the things I've learned is to be true to your own values, Mm. which might seem a slightly non-business thing to say. But to me, integrity is absolutely key. It's my top value, if you like. And it was when that value was infringed that eventually I left my my old corporate career. And it's very key to me now. So I, I think because integrity is really important to me, that means things like being completely honest with my clients, making sure they know exactly what to expect at every stage in the process, being completely transparent about costs and fees. For somebody else... Whilst integrity, in my view, integrity is important to everybody, somebody else might have a slightly different top value. And so I would say to them, be very clear what's really important to you and make sure that you live that in the way you run your business because that will come through and your client, it will resonate with your clients that you are, to use a somewhat overused word, authentic. So be, be true to yourself, be authentic. That's one lesson. Another one I would say is is definitely around making sure you whether it's in, whether it's because of integrity or not make sure your clients know what to expect at every step of the way and make sure you're completely clear on costs and probably on the subject of costs make sure you get paid so don't be afraid of chasing up outstanding payments because the longer you put it off the more difficult it is and the more likely you are to generate ill will that brings us back to a subject that we touched upon at the beginning of this conversation, which is uh, in some of your coaching program and with some of your coaching clients, you're helping them actually get out there in the marketplace what they are actually worth for the work they do. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about the work you do on that front and also how integrity plays into that? Why is that important for the person to get paid what they're worth? And how does that change the way they actually deliver their service in the end of the day? Oh, that's quite a big topic. Um, yes. So my starting point is always not to think of yourself. Uh, if you run a ser- if you if you sell a service, then the natural temptation is to think about how much you're charging an hour, mm. because a service is normally a period of time. Well, whatever service you sell, it's normally your time that you're selling. And therefore, I hear people go, but I can't, I'm not worth £20 an hour, £30 an hour, £50 an hour, £100 an hour, £500 an hour, whatever it is. And I go, yes, but it's not the 60 minutes that you are sitting in front of the client that you're charging for. You're charging for the 10 or 20 or 30 years of experience and all those years of training that you've put in to enable you to deliver that service. And one of the questions I usually ask them is, could an 18-year-old school leaver do what you do the way you do it? And that starts to generate that awareness of, well, of course they couldn't. And then I go, okay, so what is it that makes you able to do it that they can't? And that starts to help them realise why they're so good at what they do. That's, that's, that's a key great. starting point. That's absolutely great. When you look back at your career journey today, Amanda, what are you most proud of? Hmm, I'm proud of a certain amount of trailblazing. I'm proud of having the courage to leave the corporate world when the time was right. And I'm very proud of the number of people that I'm helping now and the impact that I think I'm making in the area to support small businesses in an affordable way to be more successful in their businesses. That's fantastic. 
Amanda, what next for you and your business? Are there any projects in the pipeline that you can tell us about? Well, this year's goal was to enter a local business award with a meaningful chance of winning. And last year, last week, last week I came third in my category, commended in the Kingston Business Excellence Awards, which I think is symptomatic, to me is indicative that I achieved my goal. So everybody keeps saying, so now what? And I keep saying, just watch this space. So I don't have 2020 goals yet, but I have lots of plans in the pipeline. Um, and I'm certainly keen to continue to grow the small business community in the area, to continue to build relationships and build my network and help more and more people locally. As we start to wrap up, I'd like to ask you a few quick fire questions that our listeners are always interested in. So Amanda, what do you do to relax outside of the office? My favourite thing is dance. Wow. Um, I danced as a child but gave up in my early teens because it was pretty clear I was never going to be capable of doing it professionally. I have a daughter who's danced all through her, who danced all through her childhood and teens. My mother was a professional dancer, so wow. I think dancing is in the family somewhere. And over the last ten years, I've gone back to ballet, back to jazz, back to tap, in and out of things. And then two years ago, I started ballroom dance, which I absolutely love. I'm taking a mini break at the moment, but about to start up again. And last summer, I was in the adults number, the mums and dads number, in the dance school show for the school that my daughter trained oh, at well all done. their years. So that was tremendous fun. We danced to Michael Bublé's uh, What a Night. And it, oh, was, wow. it was brilliant. It was a lovely jive number. So that was great, great fun. So dance, absolutely. And that leads into enjoying musicals. So I love going to the theatre watching musicals. Um, other than that, I guess gardening, reading. Uh, I'm a very, I'm an avid reader. I read an awful lot and joined a book club at the beginning of this year. So that's something else I really enjoy doing. Well, on the subject of books, are there any books that you've recently read that you'd recommend to our listeners? I've just been reading Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. And I'm a huge fan of Malcolm Gladwell, but actually this one I don't think I would recommend. But what I, at least... I've struggled with it, and it may be that when I get through it, I'd have a different view. But I definitely would recommend Malcolm Gladwell's uh, The Tipping Point, which is probably his most famous book, and Blink, which I've just reread, reread and really enjoyed. Um, the last book club book we read, which was my choice, was called The Land Where Lemons Grow by Helena Attlee, which is all about the history of citrus in Italy. Wow. Um, and we had our book club meeting on Monday and we discussed it and it was probably the book that generated the most lively discussion so far this year because we had everything from people who thought it was really irritating to people who thought it was amazing. So that's probably a good one to choose. They're really interesting recommendations. Are there any movies or TV shows that you've recently watched that you'd recommend to our listeners? So I'm not a TV watcher at all. But having said that, I do like my Bake Off and my Strictly. So those are really the only two things pretty much that I watch these days. Uh, but I did also go, and, and movie-wise also, I hardly ever go to the cinema. I'm definitely more a reader than a watcher. Um, but I went to see Downton Abbey and I, I love Downton Abbey, love the series, really wanted to go and see the, the film and loved it for two reasons. The story is very clever brilliant writing but the scenery is just stunning too and on the big screen it so much has so much more impact than it does on your tv finally where can people go to find out more about you and your business so my website is businessmadesimpler.co.uk and you can also find me on facebook business made simpler on twitter at as at amanda c coach and i'm also on linkedin Fantastic. And for the benefit of our listeners, I'll make sure that I link up those resources on the on the show notes. Fantastic. Amanda, thank you for joining us here on the Inside Kingston podcast. It's been a pleasure getting to know your story. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. That wraps up another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Make sure to check out our guests' website, pay them a visit, and help spread the word about what they're doing. If you have any questions or know someone who should be a guest on the show, please feel free to get in touch. I would also love it if you could go to iTunes and leave us a review and a five-star rating. We work hard to bring on some great guests and getting a review from you is one way to help the podcast rate well on iTunes so that others can find and enjoy the show too. Thanks for listening.